All right, we're all set. Cool. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Fallen Utopia, bringing the world of Pamela to life with Unity 5. Uh, it feels really great to be here at Unite. Uh, it's an awesome event. We've been here a couple couple years in a row now here, so it's awesome to be able to be sharing a little bit of this information back with the community. Um, this talk will be a bit of a pre-mortem, if that's a thing. Uh, the game's not done yet. We're anticipating a 2016 release date, but uh, we've been working with Unity 5 from the early alpha stages, so you know it's a kind of a good opportunity for us to share a little bit of that back, and hopefully you guys can uh, take away some something that's really going to help you as well. So this talk is going to be about uh, it's split into three sections. Uh, so the first bit, uh, the first two bits are going to be shorter. I'll be talking about our inspirations and motivations behind Pamela. Uh, our architectural design methodologies behind the way we kind of design and build the world. Uh, and lastly, I'll be talking about our visual pipeline in Unity 5, which will be the by far the largest of the three parts because this is Unite after all, so I want to make sure there's lots of Unity content in there for you guys. So I'm Adam Simonar. I'm the studio director and level designer at Envive Studios. I come from a background in architectural visualization uh, at Envive. Some of you might be familiar with some of the work we've done. Um, on creating some uh, large-scale architectural visualizations in Unity. Uh, and I love creating inspiring interactive environments. Uh, I'm, among many other things, I'm responsible for designing, uh, building, and lighting our world in Unity. And let's start here. So what is Pamela? Uh, can I just get a quick show of hands just for my curiosity who already knows what Pamela is about? OK, cool. That's, that's, that's good. I can explain. <laughs> So the, the short description, I guess, would be uh, Pamela is an open-world survival horror game that takes place on Eden, uh, an isolated floating city. Eden has undergone a tragic biological disaster that has ravaged its citizens and brought the city to its knees. Um, so that's kind of the short little PR blurb for you. Uh, since we've been working day and night for the past few weeks on this, and everyone loves videos, I'm going to play our, our new trailer, which just went live yesterday. So what the heck did you guys just see? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Pamela is a game about inhabiting a massive open sci-fi world. So every inch of the world is designed by hand, one piece at a time. Uh, the world of Eden includes a huge variety of areas to explore, uh, as you've got a bit of a taste of here, from dark maintenance hallways to open exterior environments to residential apartments. Um, all this environment is completely interconnected. You can explore uh, through all of it completely, uh, completely open, you know, similar to, uh, to other games by The Forest, for example, another awesome game made with Unity. Um, and we're building this seamless world, essentially. 
So one of the, uh, the major themes of the game is discovering the terrible costs of pursuing perfection. So the residents of Eden have been afflicted with a horrible and painful disease, killing most of them and putting the rest into a tribal feral state as they're overcome by uh, pain and suffering. Uh, so this theme runs through Pamela at a fairly deep level. Uh, we're exploring the idea that artificial human evolution is not necessarily a safe or even desirable thing and can have uh, unforeseen consequences. I don't want to give away too much of the story, of course, um, but suffice to say, you will be able to discover what went wrong as you're exploring the environment and you're uncovering, uh, uncovering the story. So you're surviving during a living, breathing, utopian apocalypse. Ian may Eden may have torn itself apart, but that doesn't mean it's a dead city. Uh, you'll, have to conflict, you'll have to contend with the afflicted citizens that remain as they're fighting for their own survival. They'll be exploring the environment, they'll be trying to, trying to find items, they'll be trying to survive much the same way that you are. Uh, they also have a personality-driven AI system. They can form their own, uh, their own alliances, their own friends, their own enemies, and you as a player can also impact this. So you can uh, choose to be hostile, you can choose to try to befriend them, or you can try to ignore them and kind of take a more stealth approach. Uh, as you saw in the trailer as well, we also have different factions from robotic security, uh, robotic security droids to uh, secretary-type robots as well as some other factions we haven't talked about yet. Uh, so along with uh, the, the gameplay of scavenging and exploring the environment, uh, the, these, these factions and all these different NPCs come together to kind of create this uh, very dynamic world that's, that's very beautiful but dangerous at the same time. And of course, Pamela. So Pamela is Eden's AI overseer. Uh, before the terrible events that unfolded, she would watch over the, the citizens and essentially keep them, keep them safe, keep the city running. Uh, and she, she was connected to every citizen on a very kind of personal level through this device, uh, as you see, that you, have, that you have mounted to your arm. So she wakes you from cryosleep into the dangers of Eden. Uh, she's, she's basically reaching out to you like a last uh, lifeline to humanity as the rest of the, uh, the citizens have essentially succumbed to this terrible affliction. Uh, she'll be fighting by your side and assisting you against the afflicted as you try to uh, survive and explore within the city. And one thing I do want to say, <laughs> just to dispel this myth, she's not a, a rogue AI of any sorts. She's very much a friendly companion to you. She's not some kind of secretly evil, you know, behind the scenes kind of, kind of character. So I could go on for a long time talking about the various games that indirectly or directly inspired us in Pamela, but uh, these, are, these are a few of the more kind of prominent ones. Uh, so all, all these games, I think, are, uh, they, they stand out to me because they have very deep kind of well-crafted universes that provide a backdrop to telling a story and sending a message, uh, especially Bioshock and Deus Ex. Uh, we actually, in some ways have uh, similar, theme, similar themes to these games in that they kind of look at uh, where humanity might be going in terms of biological, technological uh, uh, engineering. And the idea that, you know, as you see in Bioshock, you end up with this under, underwater utopian city that sounded great, and then in the end it actually wasn't so great. Uh, maybe biologically engineering yourself to be this kind of transhuman being is not really what we're supposed to be doing. So I think these games all succeeded because of their uh, commitment to this believability in the world they're creating, uh, both with their, uh, the visuals, the story, and everything that presented this kind of cohesive uh, whole that essentially makes you able to be drawn so deeply into the story. So why are we making Pamela? Uh, we love open world survival horror games. It's a genre that's, as you probably all are aware, has been uh, booming quite a bit lately. Uh, there aren't really any in this specific uh, genre yet, though, however. There's, there's a few, uh, We Happy Few, uh, Routine, a couple of games that uh, look, look really great that are in development still. Um, but, you know, cliche, right, about making a game that we want to play. Uh, I think it is important to, to build something that you feel passionate about, that you're going to be able to motivate yourself to do these you know, ridiculous long hours. I'm sure everyone here is uh, probably more than familiar enough at this point with. So let's, let's make something that we love and let's do it in a way that we can you know, put our own spin on it as well. So taking a new look at, at how we do things, both from our kind of level design to our UI design, uh, you know, uh, and make it unique. 
So uh, our level design. First and foremost, uh, Pamela is a game about inhabiting a believable space. Uh, as a survival horror game, that's, I think, probably the most important thing, is that you can place yourself in this environment, that you can kind of lose yourself and become uh, immersed in, in the environment, essentially. Uh, so note I'm saying believable, not necessarily realistic. Uh, I, think, I think realism and kind of that whole, that whole idea kind of gets thrown around kind of as a synonym with, you know, better, right? Uh, and I think it's a bit more complicated than that. I think at the end of the day, believability in that you can, as you're playing the game, it doesn't necessarily look like real life, but it looks like something that is cohesive and uh, doesn't ever break immersion once you're playing it. So to, to achieve this believability that I'm talking about, uh, we design our environments as if they were real world places. So uh, the design process, of course, is gonna be different for every person, potentially very different. So I'm gonna be presenting some of our uh, steps that we take in, in designing our environments. Uh, of course, this is just what works for us, so you can, you can take bits and pieces and, and see how that meshes with your existing approach. Uh, the first thing I want to touch on, I think is the most important, uh, is design the world as if you were living in it. So it sounds kind of obvious, I suppose, uh, but as you're, as you're building, as you're modeling and populating your scene, uh, you, you want to essentially be imagining yourself in that place continuously and, and asking yourself, does this feel correct? Like, does this apartment feel like something that I can imagine you know, myself living in, right? even though we're designing a sci-fi world, uh, it still needs to feel realistic. It still needs to feel believable when your players, you know, exploring the environment. Uh, if you as, I think if you as a level designer can't identify with, with what you're creating as you're building it, you're gonna have a much more difficult time getting your players to, uh, to actually be invested in it as well. Uh, so make it identifiable. Uh, this is similar to the last point and kind of is a byproduct. I suppose, uh, but what I'm talking about here is more directly focused on the, on the player. So whether something is identifiable or not is kind of a difficult thing to put your exact finger on. Uh, it's, it's basically that feeling when you, when you walk into a space that you have that kind of deja vu uh, type of reaction to it. You say like, okay, this feels like a place I've kind of been before. It's different, you know, it's, it's obviously, we're, we're, we're making a sci-fi world here. We're not trying to mimic reality exactly, uh, but it still needs to feel correct. It still needs to elicit those kind of emotional responses you get of, of you know, coming home or, or going to the store. Uh, this is where reference material uh, proportions and iteration become very important, making sure things are, are just kind of the right size. So when you walk up to a counter, it doesn't feel like you're a giant or you know, doesn't feel too high. Um, and again, even though we're not trying to mimic reality exactly, uh, reference material is, is always important because it's kind of giving you your basis on which people are gonna be relating to from their own experience. And at the end of the day, even though we're designing something futuristic here, uh, the, the physical ways that people interact with our environment uh, is not really gonna change. We're still gonna be the same height. We're still gonna be you know, walking on two legs, at least you know, for, the, for the foreseeable future. So these kind of basic ways that we kind of traverse and track with the environment aren't gonna be changing. So designing memorable places uh, kind of sounds, again, a little bit obvious, like design good places, design something that looks pretty. Uh, it's, what I'm talking about is a little bit more than that. It's making a conscious decision when you're designing something to kind of be asking yourself, is this memorable? You know, as someone explores this area, are they gonna realize that they've, they've come from a different place and now they're in this new area? And this is gonna do a couple things for you. Uh, it's gonna make it easier for the player to kind of make this mental map of your, uh, of your game. You know, they'll remember, okay, now I'm in this kind of circular area with these, with these big trees and this kind of big obelisk sort of statue in the middle. Uh, I, can, I can remember kind of where that was in relation to that other area that was before. And that's going to help people to feel, especially in an open world game like this, that's going to help people to not get lost, essentially, you know, getting turned around. Uh, you want to find that nice balance between making your environment uh, seamlessly flow together, but not making it feel just kind of like one endless series of corridors that all kind of look and feel the same. 
Uh, and the other aspect of this is uh, your, your time is limited, right? Unless you have, you know, a hundred artists on your team who can just kind of crank out environments day in, day out. You want to be very careful where you're spending your time. So if you're designing, you know, let's say you're, you're making 10 rooms in a day and those rooms all feel exactly the same, you know, that, not that that's, that's a bad thing for every game, but, uh, but you, you want to make sure you kind of look back and say, okay, is it good that all these places look the same? Should, should they feel more different than they currently do? Uh, and just to make sure that you're, you're kind of spending your time building something that's going to feel substantial to the, to the player as they're exploring your environment. And you want to tell stories along the way. So uh, this has a couple facets to it. Uh, there's kind of two different ways of telling stories. Uh, it, I think there's a kind of direct sort of storytelling. As you can see in this image here, you have these, you know, these two people kind of slouched over on each other, and you can kind of connect with the, the emotion, like, the sadness of them you know, spending their final minutes together. And it's kind of something that you're directly, you're directly seeing from the image. Um, of course, there's many other ways of storytelling. There's, uh, you know, talking, there's audio logs, there's uh, text logs, all this kind of stuff. Uh, in addition, the other storytelling that I'm talking about uh, is, is not necessarily actually telling a story to your, uh, to the player as they're playing the game, but telling the story kind of to yourself as you're designing the environment. So what I'm talking about here is uh, looking at this hallway. We have this one kind of direct story of these two people who, are, you know, had this horrible you know, last few moments together, uh, that's kind of an obvious thing. Aside from that, as, say, as I'm designing this place, I'm also thinking about, what about the guy who used to work here, right? What about, you know, Joe, the maintenance guy who used to come through here to, to sweep the floor, for example, and, and thinking about how people used to use these spaces. Uh, and as you're, as you're designing all these areas, and you're kind of making these stories in your head, even though they don't get explicitly told to the player, you're not saying, hey guys, Joe used to you know, sweep this floor. Uh, in your head as a designer, these kind of stories are gonna build, they're gonna build the kind of reality and believability of the universe within your own head. Um, and I, I think in turn that, uh, that helps to build your confidence and that helps to uh, you know, indirectly uh, help, it, it kind of seeps into the design and makes it a bit more, a bit more believable. So why is all this so important? Uh, horror, I think at its core, is about taking something safe and making it terrifying. Uh, just for example, look at uh, PT, uh, right? Uh, took this kind of normal house and you know, putting you in this loop around it with these, these kind of crazy, terrifying things happening. Uh, you know, it was a really horrifying experience. So before you can achieve this, you need to kind of create something beautiful and desirable, or at least beautiful and, well, not even beautiful necessarily depending on the game, but you need to create something that's believable, that you can place yourself in, uh, that you can feel like you're part of and, and maybe even feel a bit safe before, you're, before you start to get scared. Okay, so let's start talking about Unity here. Uh, so we've been using Unity as a team since the 3.5 days. Uh, we've been working with Unity 5 from the, uh, the, the early, early alpha stage. Uh, back when all these, all these great features were just starting to get implemented. As, as you all know, Unity's brought some, or Uni 5 rather, has brought some really amazing new tools into the picture that are available to everyone uh, rather than just pro users, which is really phenomenal. And that puts really great tool set in, in everyone's hands. So in no particular order, uh, this is basically the uh, short version of the visual pipeline Unity 5. Uh, we have Enlightened Dynamic GI, of course, powering our lighting. Um, I'm not going to be talking too much about uh, baked static GI here. We're, we're using Dynamic, so that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, physically based shading, again, this is available to everybody. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's really powerful, brings a lot of predictability to your workflows. Uh, reflection probes, a great way to add uh, cohesion to your scene to kind of ground your objects together. Uh, and, and they're really easy to quickly propagate in your scenes. And then, of course, we have post-processing uh, image effects, which, as everybody knows, uh, have a great way of making everything look nice and shiny and glossy, and I'll be kind of going over our post-processing stack uh, at the end there. And then 4.5 here, 
is the indie asset store. Uh, I'm focusing mostly on uh, visual assets. There could probably be an entire talk about all the awesome workflow enhancers that are on the asset store. Uh, I'll be focusing more on the, the visual ones for, the, for this presentation. So Enlighten. Uh, as, uh, again, as you've probably all seen, Enlighten has the amazing ability to bring fully dynamic GI to your game. Uh, I think we literally cried tears of joy when this was announced at GDC 2014. Um, it is, um, it's an amazingly powerful tool uh, that opens up a huge amount of, uh, of kind of gameplay elements, as well as, of course, the visual fidelity it can bring to your game if, you're, if you have a highly dynamic environment. So the nature of our environment uh, relies heavily on soft, natural lighting that can adapt to all kinds of different lighting conditions. So we have day-night cycles, of course, uh, and we also allow the player to turn on and off uh, lights, uh, you know, at their, at their will. Uh, and the way we do that is largely through emissive surfaces. So uh, it, you can't see in this, uh, this image here, but uh, for example, you can create large emissive strips in your environment uh, and simply turn those on and off through changing the material settings, and that can propagate to, uh, to create really nice, really soft GI throughout your scene. Uh, and it would, in my mind, it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to achieve the same kind of look without dynamic GI. Um, it does have, of course, a, a cost to it. It's not free, uh, but depending on how you're using it, and if you're careful with your updates, it can be, uh, it can be pretty, pretty performance friendly. So here's uh, an environment with just a skybox probe uh, for the lighting, and here is uh, dynamic GI enabled. So when you're looking at this, it almost looks like this is like a different color correction or something is like, you know, there, there's some other kind of trickery going on. Uh, and, and it really is as simple as just, you know, enlighten on, enlighten off. That's, that's all the difference there. So in this, in this scene uh, with enlighten enabled, you can see that nice orange sunlight is bouncing around throughout the scene, and it's really giving you that that feeling of sunlight, whereas the other, uh, the other one with just the Skybox probe lighting uh, feels very flat. It's kind of this just blue, you know, which, you know, doesn't look terrible, but it doesn't really sell you the, on the environment really feeling like a place. You don't have that feeling of being kind of enclosed by these massive uh, concrete walls around you. And of course, uh, this can be changed in real time. So this is using not a, not a crazy high, uh, resolution. I believe this was actually, I think, even less than one. I think this is 0.5 um, for the resolution. So you can, you can get away with fairly low resolutions and still achieve pretty nice results. Of course, depending on your game, you, you have to play with the resolution a little bit to find what makes sense for you. So I think lighting uh, serves a very important role in, the, in level design. Uh, again, this seems it could potentially be, uh, be an obvious thing. But what, what Enlighten does for you is you can import your geometry, you can pre-compute it, and instead of having to say, okay, what does my level look like during the daytime, what does it look like during sunlight or during, uh, during sunset, and have to do this lengthy, you know, rebaking all the time, you can import your geometry, pre-compute it, and basically any kind of lighting scenario, uh, you can preview. So you don't have, have to spend you know, hours and hours wondering what your levels can look like at different times of the day. Uh, you know, you pour your geometry, put a nice low uh, pre-compute resolution for, for iteration, uh, and play with all kinds of different times of day. That's, that's what I would suggest. That's what I do. Um, basically, import something and run it through the gamut of, you know, lights on, lights off, day, night, day with lights on, night with lights on, you know, all these different, uh, different variations. So using a realistic resolution is probably the kind of most important <laughs> piece of advice I could, I could give you for using Enlighten. Um, there's a lot of settings you can dive into, but it, as a general note, setting your resolution to something that makes sense for your game is probably the most important place to start. So we're using between one to two pixels per meter. Uh, certain areas are even less than that, um, which is kind of the most we can get away with because the more you start increasing this resolution, you're waiting longer for your pre-compute times, and also that's gonna be increasing your, your overhead for uh, running and lighting for running and lighting updates. Uh, when you're iterating, this can drop down to probably 0 0.05 pixels per meter uh, for much, much faster pre-compute times. So I would, uh, if you're not already doing that, I would highly, highly recommend, uh, you know, dropping down to those low resolutions. It may, you know, it, it's obviously, to keep with a grain of salt, it's gonna look a bit artifacty. 
it's going to look a bit noisy. But, uh, but in general, it's going to give you a good idea of what your level is going to look like with your full resolution. And it's going to save you hours and hours, you know, probably hundreds of hours over the course of your production. And use light probes whenever possible. Uh, you want to be as stingy as you can with objects that are GI static. Uh, it, it can quickly get out of hand, uh, and your pre-compute times and your overhead are going to be uh, you know, in increasing exponentially if you start setting everything to static. So we have the, the, the systems view here, which is just showing the static objects. Um, I could probably even have a few less things set as static in this example, uh, to be honest. But you can see there that it's just basically the walls and the floor uh, and the ceiling. That's about it. And then you can see the scene, of course, with, with all the actual probelet objects in there. You know, fills it up nicely. They all fit very nicely in the scene. Uh, but it's an order of magnitude cheaper than if I had just gone and set all those things to static. Plus, your bonus is you can actually move these probelet objects around as well, uh, which which of course looks great. Your characters are going to pick up the probes, um, and everything's going to going to mesh nicely together. And again, they can update all in real time uh, for again a relatively small performance overhead. Uh, Enlighten comes with a few different view modes that you can access in your uh, in your scene view. Uh, so we have our albedo view, which is essentially uh, how Enlighten is viewing your textures in your scene. You can see here it, it basically reduces all of your texture information to be like, you know, gray, white, black, green, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but this is kind of a good way to see how Enlighten is, is uh, looking at your scene. So you can see if there's any important texture details that perhaps are being, uh, are being left out, something that like, you have like a red stripe on your floor that's not picking up, for example. You can see whether you might have to turn up your resolution a little bit, uh, or perhaps you can uh, play with the uh, shader um, MetaPass, uh, which I'm not talking about here. There was a, a presentation yesterday. Um, uh, Casper from Unity did a good job of uh, explaining how the MetaPass works if you want to get into some custom shading. So uh, you know, you could Google that. I'm not going to dive into that too much in this talk. Uh, we have our emissive pass as well, which shows essentially your emissive surfaces. Uh, fairly straightforward, but it's a good way of identifying that Enlighten is actually picking up all of your emissive surfaces that you want it to. And we have our Radiance Pass, which to me is kind of my, my favorite and, and I think one of the most useful of the passes. It basically is going to show you exactly what Enlighten is actually doing for your scene. So you, you can see we have this nice kind of blue ambient light. We have some orange light bouncing from the sun. Um, and we're, we're able to get a basically raw output of, of what Enlighten is doing. Uh, and I find this particularly useful because when you look at the shaded view, you don't really get a sense of exactly what Enlighten is doing. You, you know that like it's looking better, you know the lighting is looking nice, but it, it's hard to tell between reflection probes, all that kind of stuff, uh, and, and these other props in the scene. It's hard to see what Enlighten is doing, you know, what Enlighten is uh, pushing out. So physically based shading could, could and is a, a whole talk in itself. So. I'm not going to be going super deep into the theory behind this. Um, Algorithmic, I believe, did a great talk yesterday. And Anton Hand uh, from last Unite did a really, really great presentation on this. So I would highly recommend checking those out if you're interested uh, on the, the theory of, of PBR. Essentially, the, the most important thing uh, with PBR is it brings predictability to your texture authoring workflow. Uh, as well as the way you light your scenes. Essentially, if you set everything up right, you set it as metal and non-metal. Uh, if you're working with specular, of course, making sure you have all those values plugged in properly, uh, everything kind of just is just going to work. Essentially, day or night, uh, you know, wherever it's positioned in your level, uh, your objects should look should look correct, and they should look really gorgeous. So Unity obviously ships with a uh, a really great PBR standard shader. Uh, and there's also a few different frameworks available on the asset store. Uh, we're using Alloy, for example, um, just to get some of the more exotic uh, combinations. But if you're, a, you know, if, you're, if you're handy with shaders, you can, of course, dive in and, and just start extending the standard shader as well. So here's a few uh, sample tiling materials. Uh, you can see here we have a few different materials from some metals. We have some wood floors, some kind of concrete blocks, uh, as well as a uh, nice little glossy plastic over there. Uh, and 
what, what PBR is doing here, I mean, there's a couple things. There's uh, the conservation of energy is probably the, the kind of most prominent uh, feature, I think, of PBR. You can notice that when you look between that black plastic uh, ball on the right there and the, the carpet on the top left, you can notice a very nice distinction between the way that light is hitting the surface, right? The, the one on the left top is very diffuse, very kind of flat and even, as you would sort of expect it to be. Uh, and the, the, the ball on the, on the right there has this little uh, sharp highlight, but then the rest of the surface is kind of just a little bit illuminated, but it's not, uh, it doesn't look kind of as, as flat and even as the other material, which is, of course, the kind of correct way it would behave. And, of course, the metals on the bottom, you know, those are entirely different. That's a whole beast on itself. Um, you can see the way the red ball is, uh, the specular highlight is bringing that red diffuse color into the highlight, uh, which, again, is, of course, a physically correct way of you're representing that material. If you're using the specular gloss workflow, you'd have to make sure you actually paint that red into your specular. Um, so that's, uh, that's something just to make sure that you or your artists are, are aware of if you're working with that, uh, that workflow. But in general, the materials just, if they're being set up correctly, they have this nice definition between them that kind of feels, feels correct without having to have a ton of kind of guesswork and, and, and infinitely tweaking values at different times of day. So on that note, here's those same materials uh, at nighttime. Um, and uh, with, with a small little point light just to accent them. And you know, I, I just want to point out basically the fact that everything still feels correct. They still feel like they fit within the scene. Uh, they're using uh, some light probes in the courtyard here. Uh, but you, you can notice the way that now that plastic ball is extremely dark. It's just got this little highlight, and it's got a little bit of a kind of rim reflection of this other uh, light in the surroundings. So when, when you're exploring at night, for example, and you have your flashlight up, you end up with this interesting contrast between some materials which are very flat and kind of get this nice diffuse lighting, and these little uh, kind of twinkles from these metallic and, uh, and specular uh, objects, which end up kind of creating this very dynamic, uh, dynamic image uh, for your player to, to experience. Reflection probes. So uh, these are great to add an extra layer of cohesion and depth to your scene. Uh, they have a great ability to just kind of tie your environment together. Uh, they're, they're fairly uh, inexpensive to render with the new uh, deferred reflection probes in 5.2, which is really awesome. So if you're like me and you want to go and put a reflection probe in every single room in your game, uh, well, maybe I still wouldn't do that, but <laughs> they're, they're, they're pretty cheap uh, as long as you're updating them correctly and not uh, putting them to uh, every every frame update mode. So here's just an example of a reflection probe one of our scenes. Um, we're getting this really gorgeous HDR cube map that it's spitting out of our environment, and that's getting applied to all the you know all the uh, objects in that environment, which is going to reduce that uh, that weird uh, thing that can sometimes happen where you have your you know little uh, shelf over on the side is pulling like the skybox reflection, and it looks like this crazy bright blue color when everything else is kind of blending nicely together. Um, so you can uh, you can set these reflection probes to have your uh, to have like a box which is going to encapsulate uh, everything within that box and apply the reflection to it. You can also set these manually per object depending on your use case. Um, if you're having any problems with them not applying to the right things, uh, as I said before, you want to make sure to avoid the uh, under the uh, refresh mode, you want to avoid setting every frame uh, unless you're kind of just debugging something or you're doing a quick test. Uh, that's going to get extremely expensive because it's essentially rendering a cube map every single frame for every single reflection probe that you have set to that. Um, so you want to be calling these through script when you uh, have a major scene update that you want to, uh, that you want to uh, propagate down to your reflection probes. All right, post-processing, everybody's favorite part. Um, so post-processing, I, I think, is a critical step to kind of bring your, really bring your work to life. Uh, you can get, obviously, so far with nice materials, nice lighting, nice design. All that kind of stuff is super important. So uh, I do want to say, you know, don't use these as a crutch. It, just throwing 10 image effects on your camera and calling it a day is, is not really the right way to be working. Uh, you know. Art direction trumps image effects. I think that's <laughs> that's an important thing to to to, to keep in mind. Um, however, 
with that in mind, image effects are a great way to extend your, the, the graphics of your game. Uh, and what's great about them, too, is you can delineate between, uh, let's say, mandatory image effects and kind of bonus image effects. So you can start to kind of set up your kind of quality settings that on, you know, on low, you're probably not going to have bloom and SSA and all these things, but you can still have your baseline uh, that's going to give your game the look that people are going to recognize. And then you can easily just toggle these on and off, depending on what, what uh, system your, your gamer is going to be running on. All right, so let's start with the uh, raw image here. So I'm bearing my soul to you guys, and this is just a raw scene view uh, of one of our apartments in the game. So we have full dynamic GI happening here. We have reflection probes. Uh, we have light probes. Uh, all of our materials are PBR all set up correctly. So this is basically what the scene looks like at the end of all the other stuff I've, I've just talked about. So this is our foundation. Uh, and now let's start building upon this. So just to one, one note, the, the order I'm going to go through these image effects uh, is not explicitly the order in which they should be applied to the camera. I'm kind of going through them in an order that uh, makes it easier to kind of visually explain. Uh, if you're curious to see what order they should be applied to the camera, there's a ton of uh, great resources online that are, that are pretty easy to find with a quick Google search. So first we have eye adaptation. So what this is essentially doing is it's, uh, in this case, it's brightening our image to a kind of median brightness value that we had uh, you know, previously established. Uh, if you were in a extremely dark area, it's going to brighten it a bit. If you're in an extremely bright area, it's going to actually darken your image a little bit. Uh, and for this eye adaptation, we're using uh, Scion. Uh, Scion Filmic Pros Processing, which is a great asset on the asset store I would highly recommend. Uh, now we have tone mapping. So if I switch between these last two, I'm just here, uh, and you look at the chair, for example, you can see there's this kind of uh, burnout happening uh, before we had tone mapping. So what the tone mapping is doing is essentially bringing these crazy high, uh, high brightness pixels, and it's clamping them down to uh, kind of realistic ranges, so you don't get that, that really gross kind of uh, color bleeding and kind of burning effect uh, on these, some, some of these gradients here. Next, we have a vignette. Uh, fairly straightforward effect, but it helps to kind of focus the user's attention towards the middle of the screen, and I think it actually helps to reduce eye fatigue a little bit as well, because you're not competing in the, the periphery of their vision. Distortion and grain, which is probably completely invisible <laughs> to you at this, uh, at this scale. Um, but it's going to add just a little bit of that, a little bit of noise into your image, uh, a little bit of subtle uh, imperfection, which can help to kind of sell uh, the, the kind of realism of the image, I suppose. Uh, it's not for every game, depending on your style, but it, it, can, uh, it can help. SSAO, uh, I'm using Sonic Ether SSAO here. Uh, again, highly recommended asset. Uh, what SSA was going to do is help to tie your scene together in a way that it's very difficult to do with just Enlightened alone. Uh, to, to do this, so I'll just switch back and forth here so you can kind of see the difference between that. Um, to do this with Enlightened uh, in real time, you'd essentially have to crank your, uh, your resolution to, you know, over 10, potentially up to like 20 or something like that, uh, which is, for, for most games, I would say probably 95% of games, that's not going to be realistic. So. SSA was a great effect to just tie everything together and kind of compensate for, for the lower resolution dynamic GI you have running in your scene. Uh, SSR, uh, this scene is not necessarily the best to show it off. I have another example in a, in a few slides here. Um, this is going to, again, help tie your scene together, compensating for the fact that reflection probes are never going to be 100% perfect because they're taken from one point in space. So Unity doesn't currently ship with SSR. I know it's in their roadmap. Uh, for, for this example, I'm using Candela. There's a few other, uh, a few other options on the asset store floating around that, uh, that, uh, that you, you can check out. They all have their different kind of drawbacks, and it can be a fairly expensive and artifact-prone effect. We have Bloom. Everybody loves Bloom, the key to AAA graphics. Uh, so uh, for, for, for this Bloom I'm showing you here, this is, again, using the Scion Filmic post-processing package. Uh, it essentially gives your image a nice kind of softness to it. It, of course, blooms your, your bright highlights uh, and, and can kind of, again, this is going to depend on, on what you, look you want to do for your game, but it can give you a nice kind of softness to the, to the atmosphere and kind of make the air feel thick almost. 
And then we have my personal favorite uh, image effect is color grading, which also happens to be the cheapest image effect you will ever come across. Uh, it's basically, for all intents and purposes, free uh, on, on PC. Uh, for, you, for those of you who aren't familiar with what color grading is, you can essentially export your image to Photoshop, do whatever kind of color corrections you want to do it there, load that back into Unity, and it's going to replicate basically uh, exactly the same result in Unity. So it's an extremely powerful effect that, uh, that I'll be talking a little bit about later more. And here we have our before and after, essentially. So that's our, that's our raw image, and that's, that's after. So that's with pretty much every image effect that you could, uh, you could possibly throw at it. Uh, like I said earlier, a lot of these are not, strictly speaking, required. I could probably, I mean, definitely, I could cut down Bloom, SSR, SSAO, uh, Distortion. You know, you could leave Vignette because it's pretty cheap anyway. So you'd end up with just a few image effects along with your color grading, and that's going to be a pretty cheap, uh, pretty cheap stack, but it's still going to give you uh, a very similar look to what you'd be getting with this, just minus a little bit of the fancy Bloom and SSAO and this kind of stuff. Okay, cool. So I'm going to go through these in a, a couple of these effects in a little bit more detail. So as I already said, tone mapping converts your image from HDR to LDR, which is going to clamp your overbright pixels as well as your extremely dark pixels. It's going to actually bring those up so they don't have any kind of uh, weird banding going on. Image effects that require HDR, such as bloom and depth of field, should be before this in the stack. If you put them after the fact, they're going to lose a huge amount of the range that they should be capturing. You're not going to get that nice soft bloom and the little uh, the bokeh effect from your uh, depth of field. And eye adaptation uh, can add a lot of uh, dynamism to the world when you're exploring. So it's not strictly, you know, required, uh, but but I would recommend it. So here's a here's an example of this kind of in action. So as we're going from this darker lobby to this outside courtyard here, you can see the way that uh, your eyes are actually adapting down. So the area is, you know, appearing darker once you're actually inside of it. And as we're pulling back here, going through these doors, it starts to get brighter and brighter. Uh, to kind of give you, the, give you the impression that you're sort of standing in a dark room, you're looking up to this bright space. Um, and this is a, a fairly cheap effect. Uh, you know, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to add. Um, that I think, especially if your game involves going between a lot of light and dark places, which, you know, probably, probably a lot of them do, uh, this kind of thing can just really sell the contrast between these spaces, and it makes you feel like the player is really moving between these totally different atmospheres. Color grading. So, as I said, this is probably my favorite uh, favorite one of the bunch. Uh, I think it's something that should probably be used uh, on anything you ever make. Uh, it's super cheap. It gives you a huge amount of uh, control over the kind of mood and the polish of your image. Um, so, I'm using Amplify Color here. Uh, again, another great image. I'll have a little slide at the end for all these that I mentioned here. Um, Amplify Color is a, a, a really great asset. Again. You basically send your screenshot to Photoshop, you do some color corrections, brightness, contrast, uh, color balance, however you want to correct your image, you load that back into Unity, uh, and that's basically going to replicate the results at a pretty much one-to-one -one, uh, one -to -one ratio. Uh, Unity 5 does ship with a, I believe it's called the color correction lookup texture, uh, image effect in the standard assets, which does very much the same thing as this. So if you want to use that, that's available as well. It just doesn't have some of the uh, kind of quality of life things like sending your image automatically to Photoshop and loading it back in. So as we saw before, oh, whoops. So we have color grading off. And if the video would play, there you go. And color grading on. So it's a pretty, a pretty dramatic increase, obviously. Uh, I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of a, a huge fan of contrast, so <laughs> it could be a little bit uh, too extreme for some, but the great thing about this effect is you can calibrate it exactly how you want it. If you're going for more of like a washed out look, uh, something more kind of grayscale, uh, you know, you can, you can do that. Uh, one, one thing I would say as a kind of general note slash suggestion, it does depend on the game, but uh, in this case, I'm not actually really touching the colors themselves in that I'm not, I'm not like adding orange to the scene, I'm not like adding blue to the scene, that kind of thing. I'm essentially just 
Uh, as you can probably tell here, I'm just essentially adding more, a bit more contrast and playing with some of the levels here. The reason why I would suggest doing, uh, doing it more that way rather than sort of adding colors into your scene, it's gonna, it's gonna help the predictability of your texturing workflow essentially. So if you're making like a red material, but then your color correction is adding all this kind of green into your environment, uh, that starts to, to mess with what you think is red versus what actually looks red in the game. So th not to say that you, you, know, you shouldn't ever do that, obviously, depending on what kind of mood you're trying to go for, it can, it can be great to kind of like override your colors with some kind of really desaturated look. But it's just a, a general note that I find helps uh, when you're working with this effect. So bloom, uh, great for achieving airy or thick atmospheres and uh, simulating that kind of glare effect you get when you're looking outside into a really bright area, for example. Uh, and this works really well with uh, the intense highlights that you're gonna get from PBR. So the sun shining on the floor, these kind of things. It's gonna help you pick up these, uh, these, these HDR highlights and it can look really gorgeous. So we have the scene with bloom turned off here and you can see when the bloom starts to come on. You get this nice, uh, really uh, pronounced kind of brightness coming from outside. Uh, it is, of course, a subjective artistic effect. This is, of course, why it can be turned on and off, depending on what the user wants to do. Uh, but it can really sell the sort of heat of, of light, in a sense. Like, you, you can feel the sunlight hitting the surface more so than you do just with it being just bright by itself. And as well, this effect has the, uh, other than just brightening the uh, bright areas, it also softens some of the darker areas, so you can, you can kind of see, it's, it's subtle, but you can kind of see even in, in the tiles in this image, they kind of, they have a little bit of a softness to it. It kind of reduces the harshness of them, uh, which, which I find to, to, be, uh, to be a really nice side effect of, of Bloom. And SSAO, as I talked about before, essentially is gonna be adding uh, more depth into your scene. All the crevices, it's gonna add this extra darkness into them, compensating for uh, a lower resolution pre-compute uh, with Enlighten. It, Definitely is an expensive effect, so this is not something that I would want to 100% rely on unless you're really confident that your, your, your game's gonna be optimized around having this effect uh, as a given. Um, again, it's easy because you can just turn this on and off, it's quick. Um, so here we have a, an image with SSAO off and on. So again, I'm using Sonic Ether's SSAO here. Uh, which just gives a, a really, really nice uh, smoothness uh, to some of these shadowed areas. If you look at the kind of support structure on the left there, uh, oops, you, can, you can just see the way it kind of ties everything together nicely. Um, and the stairs especially, these kind of fine grain areas, it has a really great way of, of pronouncing the detail in them. And then you have your raw SSAO pass, so you can see exactly what that's doing there in your scene. Uh, SSR, again, like I said, uh, there are no currently uh, shipped SSR effects with Unity. Um, you kind of got to get it from the asset store or uh, I think there's one floating out on the forum somewhere. Uh, again, it's an expensive effect and it can be very artifact prone depending on which S uh, SSR you're using. It can cause some very strange effects if you have floating objects in your scene. Uh, but it can do a really great job of tying your scene together and kind of compensating for the fact that reflection probes are not going to be uh, are not going to be quite perfect. So here, this example shows quite nicely what the effect is doing. So this is off, and that's that's on. So you can see the way the pillar now feels like it's really sitting on the floor there versus before, where the because of the way the re reflection probe is taken, you actually don't end up seeing that pillar really at all in the reflection. Um, so. It's, uh, you know, in, in general, it's gonna pretty much objectively uh, enhance the sort of fidelity of your especially shiny surfaces. Uh, it, again, it's expensive, so I wouldn't, again, rely on it like you're definitely gonna be using it. Um, I would suggest, of course, using reflection probes first to get as far as you can with those before you start just throwing SSR onto everything and kind of calling it a day. All right, and the Unity Asset Store, so. Otherwise known as this stuff could cost 50 times as much and still be a bargain. And that's really, really the truth. Um, I always kind of shake my head a little bit every time I hear someone complaining about like, why does this cost, you know, $40? That's crazy. But uh, when, when you look at the quality of some of the stuff you can get on the store, um, it's, it's just in, insane, uh, to be honest. I don't know how some of those people even, <laughs> even, even make a living on some of that stuff. Um, so as I said, I'm going to be talking mostly about 
Uh, I already kind of have been talking about it, but uh, I want to give you a quick little shout out to some of the, uh, my personal favorite assets on the store. Again, these are all visual related assets. So we have uh, Alloy Physical Shader Framework, uh, which is just a nice shader suite that contains all kinds of different exotic shaders like skin, uh, car paint, these kind of things. That, that can, if you're not a if you're not a shader guy, like like I am, definitely not a shader guy. Uh, these can uh, just just enhance your your range that you can achieve uh, with your materials. Uh, amplified color and motion blur, uh, two other fantastic assets. Amplified color, as you've seen, I've been using here. Uh, I didn't show off the motion blur specifically, but uh, it's a great motion blur effect. Uh, SE Natural Bloom and Ambient Occlusion by Sonic Ether. Uh, two more fantastic assets I'd recommend. The ambient occlusion effect is really, really top-notch. It gives you some really nice color bleeding in your image uh, that I could have, uh, could have shown off a bit more there, but it almost gives you a little bit of this like faked GI effect in some of, the, in some of these crevices, which is just, just gorgeous. Um, and Scion Film and Post Processing, which is a, is a newer asset, and it's uh, actually really cool because it kind of combines a lot of different effects into one. Essentially, you're vignetting your tone mapping, your adaptation, grain, uh, what else am I forgetting here? Depth of field does as well. It, it basically is this whole suite uh, of different effects packaged into one, uh, one effect, and it's, it's a lot cheaper than having all those, those effects separately on your camera, and it actually gives you really great results too. So uh, again, uh, if you're looking for a nice performance-friendly image effect that does a lot of these things that I've been mentioning here, uh, I would highly suggest that as well. Um, and many more. I could go on and on forever. Um, we're using a ton of other stuff uh, for different AI packages, um, some, some workflow enhancers. Uh, so I would just, just say, I guess, as a note to, to never be too kind of proud, I guess, to, to you know, pick something up from the asset store um, unless you, know, you think you can do something similar and better in, you know, in less time, right? Uh, even if something's 20 bucks, when you think about the value of your time, uh, 20 bucks is not going to really get you that far, right? Uh, especially if you're, uh, you know, if you're working your spare time, you're trying to support yourself. Uh, it, can, it can really make a huge difference in your workflow. So to recap, um, start with a clear vision and don't compromise on that vision. Uh, you've got to be confident in what you're doing. Uh, you know, confident in the story you're trying to tell, the message you're trying to convey. Uh, design as if you were part of the world. So as I said, placing yourself in the environment constantly as you're designing, as you're iterating, uh, I think is a must to really create something that your players are going to be able to identify with. Uh, make the most out of Unity 5's awesome tool set. There's a ton of new stuff in Unity 5. Uh, it's been out for a while, so I'm sure everyone's kind of familiar with it already, but just make sure you, you, know, you know these new features, make sure you're using them uh, you know, if, if you can, and uh, kind of reap the benefits. And then extend what's already there with uh, quality assets to make your life even easier. Uh, again, can't, you know, can't recommend that enough. There's a lot of great stuff out there, and it helps the community as well, so that's a bonus. All right, and uh, that's it. Any questions? <laughs> So there's two mics here. People can come line up at. Um, so I was kind of curious. Uh, you said you made like a lot of use of emissive surfaces. Um, to what extent did you just rely on like those realistic light sources, or did you uh, did you add in a lot of like fake lighting, like invisible lights, to kind of like emphasize certain areas, or did you stick with the the realistic? lights that you would actually see in the world? Uh, right, it's, it's kind of a, a mix. Uh, so starting with emissive surfaces primarily is a, is a good kind of like baseline. Uh, using just emissive surfaces by themselves has a few drawbacks in that you don't get the same kind of specular highlights as you would with an actual point light. So uh, like say if you have a, a really big spotlight that you want to be you know, shining on characters so they go beneath it, for example, you'd want to accent your uh, emissive lighting with probably like a spotlight or something as well. Um, but in general, uh, if you start with just emissive and then kind of see where the potential problem areas are, see where you need some extra accent, uh, then you can go in with real-time lights and kind of fill it in. That's why I suggest. 
In your demo, you had like a dynamic clouds that going on. Did you use assets or? Uh, yes, that actually was the time of day asset uh, day. that we're using for our Sky Dome. And it ties nicely into Uni5's uh, GI and reflections, so it's a pretty easy integration to make. Um, I was just kind of curious about the density of your reflection probes and placement of them. Right. Uh, so, uh, in, in our situation, uh, we're, we generally try to use as few as possible while still covering uh, each area. So, for example, like if I here, let me uh, quickly like go back to a slide here. Um, this one's a kind of good example. Um, so, for example, in this residential scene, uh, I don't have like one reflection probe on one side of it, one reflection probe on the other side of it. It's basically just one probe for like the entire area, uh, for the entire space. Even though you could potentially put more to get more accurate reflections, uh, generally speaking, especially if you don't have like super mirror shiny materials, you can kind of err on the side of being a bit more conservative and sort of. Uh, you know, getting good enough reflections that no one's going to notice that they're incorrect. So. Cool. Thanks. No to uh, go along with all the real-time effects, did you find yourself using Unity 5's um, baking for lighting and shadows as well? Uh, we didn't use any baked lighting. Uh, main reason being all the basically all the areas. Uh, indoor or outdoor are all dynamic, basically. So the, as the time of day changes, all the lighting is going to be updated, and players can also actually turn lights on and off themselves. So basically, uh, we're in this kind of unfortunate situation in which n pretty much none of our environments are ever like static, right? It can always be, it can always be different. So we unfortunately couldn't really rely on any baked lighting for that. Um, so I can't really speak too much about that. <laughs> so I don't want to say anything that's going to be like um, misleading, but. Uh, Hi, how are you doing? Um, after on your last slide, you said something about um, have a clear vision of where you want your game to be, but and don't compromise. Since you're working with a team, you probably have to um, have some sort of like discussion arguments about like where you want to take your game. How do you actually compromise on quote unquote compromise? How do you do that? Sure. Yeah. So we're we're uh, we're a small team. Uh, there's six of us now. So I mean, we obviously have uh, we're able to have pretty good communication. Um, compared to you know like a 50 100 man team, but uh, but in terms of not compromising, it's it's a tough balance, and I mean you have to rely on uh, everybody everybody in the team being both confident in in what they're doing um, and passionate about it, while also never losing you know objectivity. You want to make sure that you're not doing something and you're like you're telling yourself it's a good idea and you're just going 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 and you're ignoring signs that maybe it's not. So it's it is a tough balance. I mean I'll say for example with our user interface the way that we have everything kind of just like on your arm physically. Uh, when we first started working with that, it was kind of like, you know, we're wondering, is this going to work? Does this even make sense? In our heads, it sounded cool. And we're kind of thinking like, you know, taking some inspirations from Dead Space. Um, but there was a period of time where it felt like, you know, this might not work. This, maybe this doesn't make sense. But in that case, you know, we kind of, we kind of stuck with it. We kept, we kept going, kept working on it until it sort of, uh, until we felt that it was as effective as it needed to be, and we ended up getting a bunch of positive feedback on it. So in that case, it uh, you know worked out. But uh, that being said, obviously all of your ideas aren't aren't always going to be right the first time, and probably a lot of them won't be. So uh, you got to find that balance, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Hey, so what's your level building process? I mean, do you build the whole thing in your modeling program and then import it in pieces? Uh, some, yeah, somewhat like that, yeah. We, uh, the nature of our environment, we don't use a whole deal of kind of modular construction. A lot of it is sort of built in, in 3ds Max and sort of imported in chunks. Um, keyword being chunks, right? You don't necessarily bring, you don't build the kind of entire level. And just one FBX, you know, 100 megabytes, like level underscore one, boom, you know, you're in Unity. Um, but uh, but but yes, we're we're building the kind of chunks and we're bringing them in and putting them together. Uh, we unfortunately can't rely too much on uh, modular construction because a lot of our environment is very organic and uh, the nature of it is uh, not very repetitious. So <laughs> unfortunately, we can't do too much of that. It's a lot of the uh, environments you've shown are pretty sterile. 
and they're very smooth and very clean, uh, kind of the opposite from that of like dead space or something. Uh, when you introduce grime or any sort of like dirt or anything like that, does that complicate the process and make it a little more difficult and that it's not really uh, consistent? Right, we, we generally design and, and build all of our levels initially uh, as sterile, kind of as they would be before, before any of this happened, um, and then add the grime as like a layer on top of that through uh, mainly decals and some, some texture work. Uh, it's, it's definitely like another step that you've kind of got to go back and sort of do another pass on your environment after you're sort of, you know, you make the clean version first, then you dirty it up. Uh, but I, I think there's, there's merit to working like that because you're, you're building it as if, again, as if you're like living in it, like this is a nice apartment, I would love to live here. And then after you have that done, you kind of go in and you, you know, you grind up a bit, you put some, you know, decals and stuff around to kind of, uh, make it a, a little bit off to get that horror uh, aspect to it. And I uh, am out of time here. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'll be, I'll be up here and floating around outside. So uh, feel free to come bug me. Thank you.